The following presentation was recorded at the Aquaponics Association Conference in Tucson, Arizona on September 21, 2013. For more information or to join the Aquaponics Association, please visit the site at www.aquaponicsassociation.org. So after the batteries um, and the disconnect, um, we have this uh, load controller. And what this does is essentially monitor the battery voltage. And when it gets down to a certain level, it shuts everything off, which is also a very dangerous thing because if you have, if you get down to the 24 volts, which is the depth of discharge of 50%, um, you shut off the system, there's no warning or anything. So everything just, it's done. So it's basically to protect the batteries. You don't want to kill your batteries, but you also don't want to kill your fish. So again, put a couple more batteries in your system if you're worried about that. Um, so you can see on this one, it, if the voltage says 12.7, I took this photo, I was originally running my system as a 12 volt system. Um, and so the batteries after they've been charged and everything's okay, it just says 12.7 because that's the, the battery of, of the voltage. After normal charge, the, the system, um, it doesn't say 24 volts, you know, that's at a 50%. You usually are floating at like 27, 28 volts um, if there's no sun out. So the voltage is always more than 24 volts. Yes, ma'am? Why did you switch from 12 to 6? That's a, a very good question. The, um, it has to do with how much loss you have in your system. What happens is you have 130 or 140 volts um, up at the solar panels and the charge controllers have to convert that down um, to a voltage that the batteries can absorb at. So you actually are wasting energy by converting that 130 or 140 volts down to 13 volts during the charge versus down to 30 volts. So there is a little bit more heat burn off out of the uh, charge controllers and you're sort of wasting some of your electrons that are coming in uh, on, the, on the system. So you're actually better off running it at 24. People even run them at 48 volts. And if you have an inverter on your system and you need to get back up to 120 volts AC, you're going from 12 volts to 120 volts. And that takes a lot of work to get that voltage pumped back up again versus running it at 24 or 48 volts. So you have to sort of decide um, you know, how much loss you want to get to the system. And originally I did 12 volts because I was going to run some 12 volt uh, pumps on my system and that could be a whole nother thing about running uh, DC pumps. Um, maybe next year I'll do a lesson on DC pumps. I have a whole graveyard of pumps in our uh, greenhouse from doing different experiments. Um, but if you want to run a DC pump, do not get a, um, a bilge pump or a live well pump. They all have brushes in them and they wear out in about three to four months. So you'll be tossing pumps like this all day long. They just, they just wear out. So you have to make sure you get a brushless DC pump. They're very hard to find. Um, I've been experimenting with a new uh, model. It's, um, it can pump uh, four feet ahead at um, a 24 volt and it's pumping about 1200 gallons an hour and runs at um, just 40 to 41 watts. And that's uh, about half the voltage of any AC uh, submersible pump that you can buy out there. And it's probably more efficient to run that pump than like an airlift system or, or something. So um, very, very efficient pump. Yes, sir. What's the name of this pump for the brand? I can't tell you. <laughs> now, it's uh, something that's in development right now. And I'm just helping the company to uh, do development. It's not actually where I work at. so. It's a little more sensitive than, uh, than that. Yes, sir. You were talking about the voltage loss and play with the 24. Could you put your PVs, instead of running them, put them into series, put them all in parallel? You can. Um, yeah. What happens is you put them in parallel, then you start bumping up the current higher. Um, the higher the current, the fatter your wire has to be. And we all know the cost of copper these days uh, is very expensive. Um, so it's all trade-offs on how you want to do it. And if you have too much current, then the charge controllers can't handle that much current. So then you got to buy bigger charge controllers. So there's a trade-off on... But your on, system's already set to handle that much current. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, to a point. But, you know, I could, if I wanted to add more 
panels into the system, I could just put another bank of four or three into it and it wouldn't overload the voltage or the current. So there's a, you know, you have to sort of figure out, you know, too much current, too much voltage, or, you know, come right down the line. One other little thing is maximum power point tracking in your charge controller it saves a ton of money. Yeah, it does. Charge controller is all over between 12 and 24. I'm sorry? Yeah, this one auto senses. As soon as you turn it on, um, it detects the battery voltage and it just knows what to do with it. Again, no special programming with that controller. It's very nice. Uh, the next part is a, uh, a breaker panel and it's just a load uh, distribution center, just like a circuit breaker panel that you have in your house. You get all that power coming into it. You want to distribute it to your different devices and you don't want to have just a big 100 amp breaker splitting off to your pumps and lights and whatever else. So you just put in some smaller breakers, you know, 15 or 20 amp breakers that can um, run to your, your pumps and whatnot. So it, it allows you to shut off one device but keep your other things running. That's a combiner box. Yes, it is. Down. It is a combiner box, but they sell it to you as a circuit breaker box too. So, <laughs> so the, the breaker run backwards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, in fact, I think it says combiner box on it. Oh, it does, okay. yeah. I knew somebody was going to ask that too. So. <laughs> and then the next is your load. Um, I have um, an inverter running on this. You have to be very careful with the inverters that you purchase because they sell them as a 12 or a 24 volt inverter. That's great if you just plug it into like your car battery that doesn't have a charge going into it. But like on a 24 volt system, if the load controllers are doing an equalization on your batteries, which is basically you're overcharging your batteries to, I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but it helps to equalize the batteries and make them uh, work better. And so now you're pumping 30 volts into your system. You have to make sure that the equipment that's plugged into it is also running, can run at 30 volts. So a lot of the cheaper um, inverters out there if you look at their specs, they'll say, oh, they can run 24 volts, but it'll say maximum voltage of 27 volts. Well, what happens after the 27 volts? Either your inverter burns out or it shuts itself off. And of course, you know, you may plug your system in, get it up and running. You think it's working fine. You walk away. It goes into equalization mode. Either your inverter dies or your fish are going to die because it shuts itself off. Um, so this inverter is actually way overkill for my system, but it was the only one that I could find that could uh, handle the 30 volts for it. And um, I'm actually going to be uh, getting rid of that soon uh, with those new uh, DC pumps that I um, am working with. And then I have some other miscellaneous electronics on the system that um, uh, one is my vent opener for the greenhouse and the other one is the, uh, the fish feeder that I use to fish my, feed my fish. So are those AC or DC? these are DC. I actually have a 24 to 12 volt uh, regulator um, that kicks down the voltage because my original design, I was going to be a 12 volt system. So I bought 12 volt uh, um, linear actuators for my vents. Um, there's five of them. They were $100 a piece and I was not going to go out and buy a, a new set. So, you know, for a $15 regulator, I just can kick it down and I'm basically burning off a little electricity using that regulator, but it was a sacrifice I was definitely willing and affordable to take. So panel position. Uh, so now that we've done the quick overview of everything, how are we doing on time? Am I all right so far? I'm the last one, so it doesn't matter, right? All right, very good. Uh, panel position uh, is also very important. Um, this year, you know, the Google spies flew over our place and took a nice satellite imagery of our uh, greenhouse. Um, this was before we added the third uh, bank of panels. There's now a, a third one sitting in between those two. And ironically, they took it right at noontime. And so you can see the shadow casting off of that is perfect. So these panels are facing due south. And nobody's from down under here, so, or due north if you're uh, below the equator. Um, so typically, we just face things uh, due south. Now, you can bend those rules depending on 
basically the main factor is if you have any shade in your yard or if you have some trees that might be in the way. So if in late afternoon you're going to have some trees bothering your system and you want to try to maximize your uh, solar uh, intake, you could you know, cockeye them a little bit to um, the east and try to get a little bit more morning sun because you know you're going to have uh, you know, wasted light in, from shade uh, in the afternoon. Um, but luckily I own a chainsaw and we've basically mowed down most of the trees uh, to the south. So, so you're from the weather where you get like an evening fog or morning Exactly, fog. exactly, yeah. And um, I just do, did a fixed bracket on my panels. Um, the reason for that is, you know, people see these nice cool solar trackers and whatnot. Um, a, they're expensive. and um, Typically, the rule of thumb is if you're using a solar tracker, you know, it can do both X and Y tracking with the sun, you gain about 20% uh, of um, your solar, or you lose 20% by keeping it fixed. And it's actually cheaper to put more panels in to make that up versus putting in a solar tracker and then dealing with the maintenance of that um, after the fact. It's a, it's a mechanical device. It's got motors and gears and electronics to do it. You get you either need a computer to run it or you use little um, you know, photo detectors and have it try to track the sun. You know, get a bird crap lands on your photo detector and it swings your panels out of whack or something. So um, it's um, just, you know, you do a fixed panel. Yes, sir. Yeah, there is a, a passive one that uses, uh, I think it's glycol in weights. Yes. Yeah, it heats up like a, the base of the glycol and basically that moves it from one air to the other and it swings the balance of the panels out a little bit and it helps them to track in the sun. Um, I would put one of those in before I put in a uh, electrical uh, tracking system. They're um, becoming quite popular. Yes. Yeah, these are, um, and I'll go into that. I actually have a couple charts to, to show how bad we are up in the, in the north. Um, these are set at around uh, 45 degree angle. Um, I actually wanted it to be a little bit steeper, but uh, when I bought the brackets, I actually told them the wrong length. So they weren't quite long enough to get me up You're to adjustable, you don't adjust these. The no, I don't adjust. I'm not. Um, the panels are heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's, you know, I could make a mechanism that, you know, I've done all types of weird mechanical things. If anybody's watched my YouTube videos, I have all types of weird things out there. Um, I just don't want to have to climb up on the roof and, you know, play with the adjustments of them or anything. And, you know, I just figured I'd sacrifice the, the, the power instead. And you're optimizing for the winter anyway. You don't need that. Yeah, the, uh, the winter, our sun angle is 22 degrees. So we're about like that. And most of the winter, we have sun coming through the trees. Um, you know, we lose our leaves, so it's not too bad. During the summer, and I'll go into that, we, it's um, 60 degrees upwards. So, you know, you know, you see the panels here, most of them are almost horizontal. Um, so 45, you just sort of pick a rough angle. Ideally, because you have less sun coming in during the winter, you want to keep your panels up to get that winter sun. During the summer, we have more than enough sun hitting these panels. I have excess electricity. I don't even know what to do with it all. Um, so you don't want to really lean your panels back because you're just you're gaining electricity that you don't you're not going to use being off grid. You know, you're not selling it back onto the grid or anything. So it, just nothing happens with it. So ideally, if you're off grid, you want to try to get your panels um, pointing um, for your winter sunlight, and that's that's your best efficiency. Oh, here's our uh, information um, in Northeast Connecticut. Um, there's this nice little chart um, from solartopo.com. I'm not affiliated with them. I just happened to find this chart online. It worked out well for me. And um, you can see here, hopefully, this is the uh, winter, the summer light. And this is the angle of the sun. Um, once the sun comes up here, this is zero degrees. And this is your sunrise, and then during the day, um, around noon or so, we hit about 62 degrees or so uh, for the angle of the sun, and then during the course of the day, it goes back down. And then, whoops, 
And then um, during the winter, this is on um, the first day of winter. I picked, of course, the worst case scenario so you could see. Um, zero degrees is way up here. So you can see the width of this chart is much narrower than the width at zero degrees down here. So we have a lot less sunlight during the day. And of course, it's at a lower angle. So you get less you know, efficiency from that sunlight coming in. And it tops off at around 22 degrees. So like I was saying, it's, you know, it barely makes it over the trees. And you know, the further north you get, the worse, the worse it is. Now comes the fun part. I hope I don't lose anybody with all the technical stuff here. Um, this is a, uh, basically a spreadsheet that I had made up to try to calculate out how big of a system that you want to have to run uh, um, your pumps or whatever you want to run off, off grid, your house, anything. If you have a house, you have a huge system if you're going to stay off grid. Um, so I just set it up where you could enter in your uh, load voltage, which is your 24 volts, and your average load watts. This is by far one of the most important things you need to know before you size up your system. You need to know how much power is your equipment going to consume. Now if you say, if you haven't built anything yet and you've spec'd out a pump and it says, oh that's a 60 watt pump, first thing is don't believe it. Pumps are never truth, the companies never tell you the truth on the ratings of their pumps. Never. I, don't, I haven't bought a pump yet that met the specifications that they printed on the box. So if you're running an AC system, buy your pump, go buy one of those little kilowatt electric meter things, plug it in and test it. You also want to test your pump under different loads. When they give you those wattage ratings, that's a no load pump. It has no head against it. It's just you know, water comes out the end. You're not pushing anything through your pipes. If you have a pump that has a load against it, the wattage of that will change. So be very careful uh, with your pumps. Um, any other electronics, you've got to calculate all that into it too. So I run less than 115 uh, watts per hour on my system. Um, but for our example here, I wanted to make it a little bit higher. So based off of that, those two numbers, it can tell you how many kilowatts per day your system's going to run um, and also amp hour. So that pump just sitting there running all day long at 115 watts, it's going to consume uh, 2.76 uh, kilowatts uh, per day, just chugging along. So, you know, I have another chart coming up that shows you how much uh, electricity costs in each region, but you know you quickly do the math and figure out how much power you're consuming just to, to keep your aquaponics system. And if you're going to try to run a business, it's a very good thing to know that's a fixed cost to run your setup. So you can say, oh yeah, it's going to cost me 60 cents, ten dollars a day, or whatever in electricity. Just you know that's a flat right off your bottom line. So pumps are also very important to try to find nice, efficient ones too. So next is, um, it's sort of a mystery number, and the next slide will show that. This is the kilowatt hours per square meter per day. And what the National Renewable en Energy Labs, I'm going to say NREL from now on, just so I don't have to fumble through that whole saying. Um, NREL has done is publish charts that show throughout the country if you had a panel that was 100% efficient for every square meter of space, that's how many kilowatts um, you can generate. That's with 100% efficiency. Now, no panels are 100% efficient. You're at 15, 16%, something like that for some of them. And the next chart, I think, shows that. So here we are up in Connecticut. And this is in December. This is the average amount of um, uh, kilowatts per square meter uh, per day that different regions um, produce. So we're here in Connecticut, right here, and in winter we get 2.5 to 3 uh, kilowatts per meter. Now if you look at Arizona, this is Arizona, right? Okay, thank you. We're down in here somewhere. Next one over? Okay, sorry. 
geography was not my thing. Uh, you can see we're down here where we got the nice bright yellow and in the, in the winter, so we're, let's say we're at, what, 4.5 to 5. So dead of winter here in Arizona, you're double what we get in Connecticut. So you can basically have the entire system um, that I had to install. So it's like, wow, maybe you can run off grid up here in you know, Connecticut. We're going to do some numbers, uh, cal other calculations uh, later on. So, you know, if you're, you're up. the AC in the winter, though, the air conditioning. Yeah, I know, you need your air conditioning. So it's like, and we don't keep our air conditioning running. Uh, only a couple times a year we have to run ours. Yeah, 